Hello. This book is called Wise Child by uh, Monica Furlong. The first chapter is called Juniper. This story is for really for around 12 years old and up. If you're younger than 12 years old, you might find parts of this story a bit scary. Juniper. Juniper was different from us. In the first place, she came from another country, Cornwall, and although she spoke our language perfectly, apart from the peas, which no one but us could pronounce properly, she looked different. She was taller, darker skinned, and although she had black hair as Finbar and I did, she, she did not have our bright blue, out, blue eyes. Her eyes were a soft, dark colour, brooding and quiet. Then again, she did not live as our women lived. She was what in our language was called a caliph. It meant a single woman, but more than a single woman, one who had something uncanny about her. In our village, the women were the wives of farm workers, of sailors, of fishermen, with swarms of children tumbling over their doorsteps. The few who were unmarried lived at home and looked after their parents. No woman lived alone, as Juniper did. Juniper lived away from the village, high up in a white stone house, set on a sort of inland cliff that looked as if, a few yards from the front of her garden, the ground had suddenly split open. Behind her house was a great meadow covered in spring and summer with flowers. Beyond that, I was one day to learn, was a moor, fragrant with mint and asphodel and bog myrtle. And beyond that again, blue mountains. At night, up there, the stars seemed very close, and by day you felt as if you were on the roof of the world. At the front of her house was a winding path that led down to the village. There were sheep tracks and caves in the red wall, in the red wall of the cliff. The front of her house looked toward the village and the back of it onto her herb garden and the moor. The most important thing that separated Juniper from the rest of us was that she did magic. When we called her a Kaylee, what we really meant was that she was a witch, a sorceress, probably in pay of the devil. Proof was that she did not come to Mass on Sundays, when the priest held aloft the bread and the wine. She came to the village when people were desperate and did not care anymore if Phil and Priest disapproved of them, when a man whose wife had laboured for hours in vain could not stand it any longer, when someone was near to death after an accident, when a child was delirious with fever, when a woman had an evil spirit, they sent for Juniper. And whatever she did, and no two people ever agreed about what she did, as often as not, the patient recovered. It did not seem to make us grateful. On the contrary, it only increased our feeling that she was a witch. I was really frightened of her as a tiny child. Mothers in our village used to threaten their children. I'll give you to Juniper if you're naughty. I wonder if Maeve was so threat would so threaten me. Of course, Juniper wasn't the witch's real name. Like so many in our village, she was called by a nickname, in this case because the plant juniper was a favourite rem rem remedy of hers. It was easy enough for people like us to get hold of. We could go and get it up in the mountain, and in, and in a village where many were very poor, it was cheap medicine for many ailments. My earliest memory of juniper was when I was a little child of three or four standing in the village while my grandmother chatted with a group of neighbours. Suddenly a silence came upon us as Juniper passed. With a friendly word to the women and a smile for me that I did not return, I buried my face in my grandmother's skirt. I can smell the fusty old woman smell now and did not breathe again until the tall figure had passed on her way. My grandmother had put her hand on my head to reassure me, but with childish logic, I reasoned that she would not do that if Juniper was not dangerous. The first time 
that Juniper and I had anything that you could really call a conversation was when I was about five. I spent a lot of time with my cousin because my mother, a woman so beautiful that she was known as Maeve the Fair, had left by then and my grandmother was getting too old to care for me all the time. My father, Finbar, was usually away at sea, sailing the angry triangle between Wales and Dalryada and Ireland. Sometimes too he sailed to Cornwall or to Brittany and brought back tin or silver ore or copper or finely wrought armour or salt. I was younger than all, but the youngest of my cousins, and, a, and an only child who had tantrums when she did not get her own way. Looking back, I'm amazed at how patient they were with me, especially as at least at the beginning I had more to eat and nicer clothes than they had. Like Juniper and many others, I was not called by my proper name, but by a teasing word that you would translate into English as wise child. This was not a compliment. It was a word for children who used long words, as I often did, or who had big eyes, or who seemed to somehow be old beyond their years. I did not mind it, since I admired my cousins so much and felt loved by them, and it was such fun to be among them and petted by them. It was an autumn day, golden and still. We had gone to the shore and played there, Connor, Domnall and Seamus and Fingal and Bride and Morag and Myrie and Coleman and me. Then, with big baskets, we had wandered until we found the fields where the blackberries grew thickly, huge walls of bramble encrusted with luscious hulls like red and black thimbles. I did not pick very quickly because I stopped so often to eat the fruit, but in the end I filled a small basket. On the way home I got tired. It was getting towards dark and it was cold and misty and the scratches on my arms and legs, which had not bothered me before, began to hurt. The basket felt heavy and I wanted to be carried. Connor carried me for a long way on his back and Coleman always a friend to me, though not much bigger than I was myself, carried my basket, but in the end they were too tired and Connor set me down on the track and Coleman returned my basket. Walk, said Connor. I had loved riding on Connor's broad back and I did not want to walk. I sulked. I dragged behind while the others waited for me and finally I sat down on the ground thinking... This would force Connor to carry me again. Very well, said Connor. We will go on without you. The Tarrens may get you, said Mary, who had always had a spiteful streak, or the people of the Sid. The Tarrens were the ghosts of unbaptized babies who were said to snatch children away, and the people of the Sid were the fairies, the, the shining ones. To my amazement, they all walked off and left me, sitting there. They were sick to death of my temperamental outbursts. Only Coleman looking uncertainly back over his shoulder. I could see their white and brown smocks growing fainter as they crossed one field and passed into another. And finally, they were gone. The darkness was edging the bushes and gently nudging its way into the corners of the fields and the sky was a dim blue, like the eye of an old angry man. I was shocked at their desertion. It did not occur to me to get up and follow them. I went on sitting on the track where they had left me, and a great loneliness crept over me. Undoubtedly the Tarrens or the Shining Ones would get me, and I would never see anyone I loved again and tears poured out of my eyes and down my cheeks, and I leaned my head on my knees and sobbed out loud with tiredness and hopelessness. And then it happened. Wise child, said a voice. There was sympathy in it. I looked up, and there was Juniper, sitting on her donkey, looking down at me. She climbed down with a lithe, youthful movement, and before I knew what was happening, had bent down and wiped the tears from my cheeks with a handkerchief. I stopped crying, mainly out of surprise, I think, and she picked me up in her arms and swung me onto the saddle. Poor baby, she said. 
My legs did not reach the stirrups, but she held me firmly on the saddle and spoke gently to the donkey, which began to walk. It was all very surprising. It was surprising too to notice that the donkey's panniers were filled with blackberries, with a few large mushrooms lying on the top of them. It had never occurred to me before that Juniper ate as other people ate. Quite soon we came upon my cousins waiting a couple of fields away to teach me a lesson. They were startled by the sight of the donkey and Juniper in the gathering darkness, and perhaps even more by the sight of me in the saddle. I did not know whether I felt smug or shy. She wouldn't walk, said Connor defensively, by way of explanation. Her legs are short, Juniper replied, without judgment. The troop of children followed us, always the same distance behind, and I could hear them whispering and giggling. One of them, it was surely Seamus, called out rudely and daringly, Teach us a spell! I looked sideways at Juniper, but she just smiled to herself and said nothing. She was silent in a particular way of her own that made me feel as close to her as if we were having a conversation. She spoke only once again, which was as we approached the village and began to see the comforting rushlights peeping out from people's homes. You may be too tired to walk today, but you'll be a great traveller one day, she said. You're not Finbar's daughter for nothing. And then she lifted me off the donkey and set me down and I stood rather foolishly in the road waiting for the others to catch up with me. What did the witch talk about? Bridie wanted to know. Nothing really, I said, keeping my secret. Just think, Coleman said admiringly, you rode on Juniper's donkey. She's called Tilly, I said. It was only because she's such a baby, said Mary. Still, it was an adventure, said Morag. In the next several years, I lost my baby plumpness and became thin and wiry. I was never an especially pretty child, and when I got the lice, my grandmother, who could not see too well, hacked off my hair unevenly all over my head so that it stuck up here and there in spikes. The children laughed at me, but I did not mind very much. I was not interested in my appearance just then. When Coleman wasn't in school, the two of us ran wild like a pair of rabbits, both of us barefoot in the summer. In winter, however, I wore neat leather shoes, while Coleman wore an old pair of patched boots with flapping soles. His clothes were very worn and much too small for him. It did not ever occur to me to pity him, however. My main feeling toward him was one of envy because he went to school. I had gone for a little while to a school for girls run by an old woman in the village, but once she'd taught us to read and write, something only a few of us mastered, there was nothing else to learn but spinning and sewing, both of which I loathed. This meant, in winter days at least, that I was obliged to spend a good deal of time at home, which I was sorry to do. Finbar, of course, had long since sailed away on his great voyage, which left only my grandmother as a companion. She, I seemed to remember, had once been quick on her feet, busy about the house, cleaning and cooking. Now she sat before the fire all day, dozing in her chair most of the time, too weary to spin or even talk. Once she had been such a grand storyteller, such a singer. I had laughed and wept and been terrified by her stories, sometimes actually putting my hands over my ears because I couldn't bear to hear any more. No, I don't want to know. And then, oh, go on, tell me. And there were no stories anymore, just that clouded, puzzled look in her eyes. Finbar, she'd once said to me. And I had said in a very frightened voice, y you remember, Finbar went away. He he'll be back soon. Our eating got more and more haphazard. My grandmother never prepared anything now, and it occurred to me to try to and it never occurred to me to try to cook any more than I tried to clean up the house. My aunt did her best to sort us out from time to time. One summer day I went to see my cousins and I said Granny's too tired to get up today. My aunt's tired pretty face looked up from the wash tub and she started drying her hands at once. I'll just go round to see, she said. 
and she put on her shawl. And later on that day, she told me. What will I do then? I said in a very loud, angry voice that hid how scared I was. And then I answered myself, Oh, I, I know, I'll come and live with you and Coleman. My aunt slowly shook her head and lifted me onto her lap, something she did not often have time to do. Wise child, you know we love you, she said, but there's no room and there's not enough food for the children I've already got. And in any case, Uncle Gregor, Aunt Morag was mortally afraid of Uncle Gregor. I knew that what she said was true. I had often seen the children in bed, five of them cram crammed together, which I would have hated, and in the same room as my uncle and aunt. I suddenly remembered how when my grandmother, in her good days, had baked a cake or made a stew, they had devoured it desperately, and how once I'd taken the last oat cake in my thoughtless way, and Bridie's eyes had filled with tears. I was a proud child who loved my own bed, my clean smock, my good leather shoes that Finbar had bought me, and I liked to eat. So what will happen to me? I began to wail. But I knew the answer before she began to tell me. In our village, which prided itself on taking care of those who needed it, we had an institution called the auction. When a child's parents, di parents died, or sometimes if a woman was left alone in the world, the village would gather together after mass, standing in a circle on the piece of grass in front of the small stone church. The priest would preside, and together they would all work out who needed the service of the homeless one, or, more often, who could, we, who could be persuaded to put up with him or her. But what about Finbar? I said desperately, trying to think of a way out. It's like him to be away when he's needed, my aunt said. The Lord knows when he'll be back. Where could you live, Chick, in the meantime? Who will look after you? I longed to say, I will look after myself, but I knew I could not do it. When my hair was still long, I could not wash it or plait it myself. I could not make a soup or stew, nor bake a cake or loaf, though hunger had taught me how to make porridge. I wept again for my helplessness, for the public humiliation of the auction. It's not so bad my aunt comforted me there are good women in this village and if they're not good if they're not good to you well they'll have me to reckon with it was not that i minded so much though it was more that i thought myself special a, a child to be prized and now all of a sudden i was a thing like a, a pot or a pan or something to be bargained over so i sat and wept throughout mass and afterwards the priest led me out to the waiting ring of villagers outside. He was an Irishman with the crinkly red hair and the flushing skin that was different from the blonde hair and the blue eyes and the clear pallor of most of our people. His hand rested heavily on my shoulder. I wriggled to get out from under it, but he tightened his hold. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who bade us to care for the homeless and the fatherless, I am asking you this morning to find a home for this little sister of ours, reminding you that charity is the essence of our faith and that you will be piling up a reward for yourselves in heaven. Despite this incentive, there was a long silence. I hung my head. Nobody wanted me, it seemed. Then Bridget from the beyond spoke. We could do with the girls' paravans about the place, especially just now with the harvest coming on, but she's really too small and she's never worked. We've always said she was a spoiled one. Greta the scarred spoke next. I could train her to work, she said. There are no lazy kids in my house. I've, uh, I, I had seen her children, anxious and worn, little workhorses before they were even eight years old. They didn't get to school much, and when they did, they had swollen eyes from weeping and the marks of beatings on them. I could feel my aunt tense beside me. What other offers, said the priest, apparently indifferent as to who should take me in. There was another long silence, and I began pressing my nails tightly into my palms to resist the fate of being taken by Greta. I will be glad to care for her, if she would like that. Juniper's deep, husky voice suddenly said. 
I had noticed I hadn't not noticed her before, but there she was, a head taller than anyone else, standing in the circle directly facing the priest. They made a contrast, the fair skinned, blushing priest and the dark, glowing woman. Philan's hand tightened even harder on my shoulder. There was no love lost between him and Juniper. She shall have a Christian home, he said dismissively. I will send her to Mass, of course, said Juniper. Philan ignored her, but I could feel his hesitation. A murmur was running around the circle. Nobody liked Greta much, and they did not want to entrust a child to her. Perhaps, too, they were afraid of making Juniper angry, since they feared her powers. In any case, they felt a pull towards Juniper. She was their magic woman, exactly as Philan was their priest. They did not care to have to choose between them. Why not let Wise Child choose herself, said Juniper. And the people murmured again. I'd turn scarlet with the embarrassment of this terrible occasion and the agony of having to choose. For the first time in my life, I looked squarely at Juniper. I saw her slender height, the laughter lines in her face. Even at this moment, she had a merry expression. Her lips parted over her strong white teeth. She had deep, dark eyes that had looked on sorrow somewhere. She wore a dark red dress. Our women dressed themselves in brown or black and a great ruby on her finger. Under the big straw hat, her skin was a rich olive and her hair glossy black like my own. I glanced at Greta at her small, bitter face closed like a trap at the long, scrawny arms with which she slapped her children. I looked too at the ch two children standing beside her with, her with their cunning, suspicious faces. I could not possibly live with Greta, yet Juniper, we all knew, worked for the devil, and if I worked for her, I might be damned forever. I wrung my hands at the terrible predicament. Just then, my Aunt Morag, poor, fearful Aunt Morag, who lived in dread of Gregor's temper and who rarely raised her voice outside of her own home, spoke up in a loud, clear voice. "'There's Finbar's opinion to be considered,' she said. "'Finbar?' said Philan in surprise. "'Before he went away, he fo foresaw the possibility of his mother's death "'and that Wise Child would need a home until he returned. "'He said that if that should happen, she was to go to Juniper "'and that he had asked Juniper to undertake this for him "'and that she had agreed.' Juniper neither confirmed nor denied this, just smiled. It took me a few moments to understand it. Child as I was, I knew perfectly well that Aunt Morag was lying. It would not occur to Finbar to plan for my future in that way. He would never have anticipated the problem. So Aunt Morag must be lying for a purpose. The purpose, I knew at once, was to give me a sort of cue. The cue that it was all right to live with Juniper no matter what I'd been told about her. I responded instantly and automatically. I want to live with Juniper, I said. The priest blushed more furiously than ever. Is there not a Christian home that will take this child? He asked. The people murmured amongst themselves again. They knew very well that Juniper could afford to feed me better than any of them could. It was all very well for Philan. No hungry children waited in his house. Uncle Gregor, perhaps, not wanting to be outdone by Aunt Morag, perhaps feeling that it was time to exert some sort of patriarchal right over his female possessions, intervened at this point. If it was Finbar's wish, he said, perhaps I'd do him, an, an, him an injustice. Perhaps he too was genuinely anxious about what would become of me. Philan knew that he was defeated, the anger showed clearly enough in his face. Very well then, he said, the Caliph shall take her. There was a slight shock of surprise at hearing him use this word. It was a word you used behind people's backs, not to their faces. Good, said Juniper. Wise child, you will need to sit with your grandmother before the funeral. After the funeral, Tilly and I will come and collect you. She gave me her warm, friendly smile, and then she slipped through the crowd and was gone. The, ca the crowd began to disperse too. 
not in its usual gossipy fashion, but quickly and silently, as if something distasteful had been completed. And then I was walking home with my aunt and cousins. I walked apart, angry at my public ordeal, but above all, frightened. What had become... What had come to me that I, alone of everyone I knew, had to live with a witch? Nobody spoke about it, but about halfway home, Coleman slipped his hand into mine. I did not acknowledge that he had touched me, but I did not let go. It was custom to sit up with our dead, and that night my aunt and I dutifully took our seats beside the body of the old woman, who now looked so different that I did, that I did not feel she was my granny at all. They had tidied her hair and dressed her in a grey dress that I recognised, but it was the expression on her face that was quite different. After what seemed an age, Coleman slipped into the room and began to sit too. It was indescribably boring just sitting there, and I wept quite a lot. Not for my grandmother, who seemed to be all right, but for myself, who was henceforward a lost soul. My aunt heated some soup on the fire at about midnight, which was a great treat. I realised that I was starving, but soon after that I seemed unable to keep my eyes open any longer. The next thing I remember is seeing bright sunlight shining on the bed, and Coleman and I were both lying in it together. Coleman was still asleep, and so was my aunt, still propped awkwardly in her chair. I thought... I want my grandmother buried so that life can begin again. But then I remembered what my life was to be. I wept quietly. Coleman woke up and saw the tears on my cheeks. He was never a child of many words. Finbar may be back at any time, he said. I'm frightened, I sobbed. Coleman did not try to comfort me, knowing that in my situation he would be equally frightened himself. Later in the day, my other cousins, less kind than he, remembered all the child gossip they'd ever heard about Juniper. Like me, they were fascinated and excited by the idea of magic, but also afraid of it, partly because they thought it was wicked, and also because they were afraid it might hurt them. It was said that witches brought diseases and poisoned crops and animals and killed people that they didn't like. She has these two huge cats that are her familiars, and they talk with her just like people. She rides on her broom. On moonlit nights, you can see her outline against the moon. She meets with other witches sometimes, and they all dance about without their clothes on, and they... And Mary went off into a gust of giggles and began to whisper something in Seamus's ear, so that he began to giggle too. And then they say, under her house... There are enormous caves with big piles of jewels, rubies and emeralds and gold and pearls. She gives you honey drinks that makes things look all different. I bet the evil one, Domnall crossed himself, comes there often. That there are ghosts in her house, unquiet spirits. That she summons up the dead. That there are murdered children there. I stamped my foot. Stop it, I said. Finbar will be home soon and then I will go to live with him. But I was very scared. My face washed. My poor uneven hair was combed back and stuck down with grease. Which Juniper told me, made my eye, which Juniper told me later made my eyes look enormous and my forehead look white and bare. I was put in a black gown that was far too big for me and I kept tripping over it and I wore good, my good leather shoes that I was so proud of. My uncle Connor and some other men carried my grandmother's coffin out of the house and I was glad to see it go for in the hot weather the body seemed to make a strange sweetish, sweetish smell in the house that I hated and I was bored with all the sitting still and the watching. Watching what? There was nothing to see. I'd chosen the things I was going to take with me. A winter smock, a summer one, my smart stockings, my grandmother had knitted in wheel stitch, my hood and cloak, a doll called Nan, a rope for skipping, and a mouse Coleman had once carved for me in wood. My aunt packed them in my basket with an apple and kissed me tenderly. You know that we love you, wise child, and that you are our kin. 
If you're in trouble, Gregor and I will help you. You are like our own child. Hmm. Not like enough, not enough like your child to live with you, I thought angrily, but I was sobbing too much to speak. So I walked behind my grandmother's coffin with my eyes swollen with crying, my throat dry and, and full of a lump. I did not seem to be able to swallow, wearing the ugly black dress that was too big for me. On the way to church it started to rain and before we got there we were soaked, hair like rat's tails, shoes squelching along the track which was dissolving into mud. The rain matched my mood, the sadness that lay on me like a weight, the sadness that my grandmother was shut away in a box and would soon be shut away in the earth, the sadness that I was lost and unloved and had a terrible fate before me. From deep in my memory came the recollection of another loss, of realising, not swiftly but slowly, that made the fair was lost to me forever. I was now nine years old and nobody wanted me except a witch. I bet she'll make you I bet she'll make you her apprentice, Seamus said. Witches choose little girls to be their apprentices, then you'll be a witch too. Shut up, Bridie said. Obviously Aunt Morag had rebuked the children for frightening me. The first thing I will do when I'm a witch, I said to Seamus, is turn you into something horrible, a tadpole. Already I had a picture of myself stirring some fetid brew over a fire with bits of live creatures chopped up in it. My heart turned over with fright and disgust. Juniper was not in the church, but when the coffin was carried out into the churchyard, she was in the group that stood around the grave. She stood respectfully with a thoughtful look on her face, as, pr as Phil and Priest said the prayers, and when the coffin was lowered and people threw flowers down onto the lid, Juniper threw some poppies and cornflowers that she had been carrying. Tilly was tethered by the churchyard gate, and when the funeral was over, Juniper stood waiting for me there. No goodbyes were said. I was still a part of the village, but people waited and watched while Juniper picked up my bag and tied it onto Tilly's back. The two of us set off together in silence, one on each side of the donkey. I looked back only once, when we were a long way down the road. They had all gone by then, except for Coleman, who was wearing a white woollen smock, much patched at the elbows. My aunt could not afford to dress us all in black for her mother's funeral. He stood there, a tiny white speck on the road, still waving at me. I waved back. As we turned the last corner and disappeared, he gave the cry of the curlew that we had so often used to summon each other, stealing secretly out of bed on summer nights. I wept for the life that was gone. And that's the end of that chapter. I'll tell you another chapter, uh, another chapter tomorrow. Next chapter is called The White House. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.